after the fall of the Soviet Union, and even China's migration to a market-based economy, even though they saw, call themselves communists, their economy is now essentially capitalist. There's been a kind of a general consensus around the world that capitalism is the way to go. And, I, and you know, just to put my bias out there right from the get-go, I, I am in that camp. I would consider myself... I would consider myself a capitalist. But what I want to do in this video is do a little bit more of a nuanced discussion of capitalism versus, say, socialism. Because I feel like there has been, a, especially here in the United States and in the West, there's sometimes a knee-jerk reaction against anything that even has a whiff of, 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 of the government getting involved, or even a whiff of, of, of socialism. So I want to think more about what are we trying to achieve with a capitalist system, and where we could fall into kind of the things we don't want to achieve if some of the aspects of capitalism are allowed to go on without any type of without any type of uh, uh, controls or or maybe some type of regulation and i don't want to advocate anything i just want to give a maybe a framework for thinking about it so you ask any capitalist including myself you say well what's good about capitalism and you I, and i would say well you know it 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 it's, it, it in, aligns everyone's incentives so it's good good incentives. If you work harder, you can earn more, you can generate uh, capital for yourself, you can use that to improve your standard of living, you can reinvest that capital. So it's good, it's a good incentive structure. And I'm not saying that everyone is motivated purely by the desire to earn. I think, you know, there's plenty of people in the world who are motivated for the desire for social good, for elevating mankind, but uh, the, the general sense is in, in a lot of parts of, you know, and, and is that those type of things are, are specific to certain domains, but in other domains, if someone's running a, a trucking company, it's not clear that someone would run a trucking company optimally just for the good of mankind. Maybe they would run some type of nonprofit that way, but a trucking company or a, a farm or something like that, who knows? So in general, you have a good incentive structure. There's also this notion in a capitalist economy that it's a meritocracy. It is meritocracy. And I'm going to... I'm going to actually put a box around this because the meritocracy in my mind is super duper important because even if you talk to us almost everyone is a fan of a meritocracy even the communists were a fan of a meritocracy they they would give exams to people and have the the people who are successful have uh, more authority within within the communist regime so meritocracy is something that other that everyone lays claim to and actually a lot of socialists or communists would claim that extreme forms of capitalism when the wealth disparity becomes too extreme or where you have inherited wealth uh, is actually goes against the idea of meritocracy. So let me actually put let me put meritocracy here, meritocracy here as well, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then the other idea is that you know you have you have innovation, you have innovation in capitalism, and these are all related. These are all related ideas that if the incentives are good, if if capital gets in the hands of people who are most deserving of it because they've somehow earned it, they've somehow innovated, that can also lead to innovation because the right people are are handling the capital. Now if we go to the social the the, the socialist side of things, they'll say, "Well, look, there's there's a social cohesiveness to this." So let me write this down. And I won't speak to the, you know, I, I don't claim what I'm going to do in this video is comprehensive of all of the pros and cons of either. I just want to give a little bit of nuance to the discussion. Uh, to the discussion. So social cohesiveness. You don't, you won't have this situation where you have, you know, a gazillionaire sitting behind a walled compound with armed guards, and there are people right on the other side of that walled compound uh, starving to death. Who, and you know, these people don't even necessarily view themselves as part of the same society, as part of the, you know, that they it's somehow have a responsibility to each other. And that is happening in some parts of the world where you have severe disparities in wealth. The, the rich people don't even kind of view themselves as uh, you know, the same species as the poor people, or even vice versa. You have the other idea of, of kind of, you know, and I'll put this in, in, in quotes, of, of fairness. Fairness. And I'll put it in quotes because one could say, well, it's fair to if you if you make more, if you work harder, uh, you should get more. If you innovate more, you should get more. And then their notion of fairness is, well, yeah, but look, you know, sometimes this wealth gets so extreme. Sometimes you have this notion of inherited wealth, generation after generation, old money. What's fair about that? That people are just randomly born into a situation where they can just extract the interest off of their wealth and never have to work, and other people have to work super hard and they really get uh, uh, nothing for it. So you know, this notion of fairness. I'll put it over here as well. Fairness, because 
There's arguments for either. And so like I said, I am definitely biased to the capitalist side of things. I think there is an importance to these things that we have on the right hand side, but the reality, at least you know what we've seen in the, the economic experiments of the 20th century, is that even though communists and socialists might speak, might speak to these type of things to a large degree it becomes even it it it, it becomes uh, there's less social uh, social cohesiveness the the senior communists in the soviet unions would drive fancier cars and they did have a very different lifestyle than the the workers and they would hide that lifestyle and then you would you know it would lead to a lot of hypocrisy uh, in general the extreme forms of of socialism not clear that it was a meritocracy it might have been just the best people climbing up the the party ladder that get, that get to the top as opposed to the people who would innovate and actually uh, produce in a better way. But with that said, I want to give fair warning. I want to give fair warning that capitalism, if it's kind of goes unchecked in certain ways, it can also lead to those same problems of socialism. And the main the main problems there when you think about good incentives. I think the incentives and once again, I'm giving my opinion here. The incentives work out well when you have a bunch of competitors who can compete and innovate. And it makes complete sense that let's say that this person comes up with an innovation, and because they have that innovation, they're able to uh, pr pr provide a better good that's cheaper to society, and so they make more profits. It, it seems reasonable that that person should get more profits and more wealth and grow, and it could even be good for society because this person's an innovator. Maybe there was an element of luck there, but it seems like they're competent at managing these resources, so it's good for society to give them more resources to manage. The problem where capitalism, uh, the areas where, where it becomes less clear that capitalism is unambiguously good is a situation where this person becomes outright dominant. So let's say that this person becomes so big that all of, that none of these other players can even compete with them. So they all disappear. This person can just undercut everybody, and all of the other players disappear. And this is a situation of a monopoly. And the problem here, monopoly. And the problem is here is when, when this guy had competition, he had every incentive to work harder. He had every incentive to innovate. It was a meritocracy because the person who innovates well grows the fastest. But once you get to a monopoly stage and everyone else has died down, this is the only player in in the economy, then all of a sudden, he has no incentive to innovate. You know, this, this, this corporation or this person can just keep raising prices. There's no competition. There's no one else to say, hey, I can have a better product or I can sell it to you cheaper. And so it actually goes against the ideas of innovation. That's why it's really important. And that's why it's part of, especially in the United States, it's part of the, the economic system that you, that you try to break up monopolies, that you don't like monopolistic practices. The other risk that you have when you start having a, a lot of wealth and a lot of influence in a kind of one entity or one person or one corporation, and this can sometimes happen, well, it can happen in a democratic or even a non-democratic regime, is that the control of resources aren't just control of those resources, aren't just control of land and buildings and railroads. They can also use it to influence government. Influence influence government. And in the United States, this has kind of been institutionalized in the form of lobbying. And when you have excess resources and you can influence government in this way, you can get the government, so let's say this is the government over here, you can get the government to essentially do things for you so it works to your advantage and maybe allowing you eventually to become a, a monopoly. So you can kind of view this as crony capitalism, where you're you know, lobbying can be a, a, a form of legalized bribery. And in that way, you kind of own the elected officials. I'm not saying that this is happening everywhere, but it could happen. And in that situation, you have the government acting on behalf of these. And once again, it goes against the idea of a meritocracy. Because when you have this cycle developing, maybe this person right over here has the innovation. But this person doesn't have the clout, doesn't have the influence with the government. And so this guy gets the government contract for the planes, or this guy uh, gets the, the, the tax benefits from the government so that he can be even more competitive. Uh, he, can, he can undercut this guy, even though this guy has the innovation. The other element, and I could talk about this for hours, and these are just things to think about, are the idea of inherited wealth. And I'm not saying that inherited wealth is a, is a, is a bad thing, but there's this idea that let's say someone, through their competence, maybe l competence with a little bit of luck, uh, is able to accrue a huge amount of wealth. And maybe they're not even a monopolist, but they're able to get a huge amount of wealth. But they were able to do it. They were able to do it 
that they're really good managers. They're kind of these, you know, really smart dude. He can he can really manage a lot of resources well. The question arises is what happens when this person passes away? In a very purely capitalist situation, you pass this on, you pass this on to your children. So you pass this on to your children. And the issue here is one, what did this person do to earn it? And also from a society's point of view, maybe this person here is a dummy. Maybe, you know, maybe there was another kid, maybe there was another kid over here who was born at the exact same time who is way, you know, way smarter and who, you know, but this this kid is is now in control of a, a hundred gazillion dollars and he can completely mismanage the resources so that they're they're completely wasted. And so you have this idea of over time inherited wealth in a capitalist society can go against the ideas of meritocracy. It can go against the idea of good incentives because if this guy inherits enough money has no incentive to work. Why should he, you know, have to study hard and go and, you know, uh, tackle math and all of that? He's inherited enough money that he can he gets millions of dollars just off of the interest and, you know, why should he educate himself? He got he got daddy's or granddad's money and so it also goes against the idea and why should he try to innovate? Why should he ever do anything? I'll just he could maybe just hire some of these people and give them, you know, kind of a minimum salary whatever it takes. And so it kind of goes against these ideas of fairness and all of that. And I'm not saying that I'm against inheritance. I'm just saying it's something to think about and there's some probably threshold of inheritance that it starts to undermine some of these these ideas of a meritocracy and good incentives and fairness and all of that. And that's why I think it's funny when people who call themselves old money old money are kind of proud of it that they view themselves as somehow being part of a better caste because old money means that you did not earn the money yourself that your granddad or your great granddad earned the money and you've just happened to be born in this family and you know are essentially just living off of the interest and it's funny because they'll talk about new money new money is is that some type of you know they're not as good as old money but at least the new money people maybe it was through luck but maybe it was through competence or innovation this is something that at least in my mind I'd respect more than old old money you've done nothing you're i mean what's the difference between old money or a king and a queen or the aristocracy of europe that uh, kind of goes against a lot of the philosoph- philosophical underpinnings of what the United States is even based on. So I'll leave you there. I just wanted to add a little bit of nuance to the conversation. And I will say, I'll say it again, you know, I, I come to this conversation with a capitalist bias, but I, I'm hoping that this gives you a little bit of more nuance so that instead of saying capitalism is an unambiguous good and socialism is an unambiguous bad, these are the things that are unamb- these are the things that we should try to promote. And to do that, we do have to do some things like make sure that everyone is educated so that we can have a meritocracy. If everyone is educated, then you have a kind of a level playing field. You have this notion of equal opportunity. And that does involve some type of re, you know, on some scale redistribution of at least in the form of education. Maybe you do need some form of uh, you know, way for people to get health care. You don't want people dying in the streets. I'm not going to take a stance here, but I'm just showing you this you can't just even though I do consider my myself a capitalism you can't just say that everything has to be purely capitalist and you can't have any any notion of government intervention you maybe want the government to inter, uh, to to uh, invest in things like long term research where they don't have an immediate profit motive but 50 20 you know, 100 years down the future it might allow the uh, society to thrive or or whatever else so so I'll leave you leave you there